have a this is Show Me The Money, it's your weekly guide to who's making the cash, how they're doing it, and what it means for the way we work. With us tonight, Digby Jones has been banging the drum for British business, well, for longer than it's polite to say. Former CBI boss, former trade minister, now an advisor to the most gold-plated of British names. The American travel entrepreneur Barbara Cassani lives over there but works over here. She'll tell us why this is the place to do business. And Ruth Lee has spent her entire working life talking about and sometimes helping to run the economy. She advises the Arbuthnot Banking Group. The cash machine is standing by. The wheelbarrows are at the ready. Europe's finance ministers will say tomorrow that they will give Greece a second bailout. That's £100 billion in new loans so that Greece can pay back some of its existing lenders. Uh, Ruth Lee, advisor to the Arbuthnot Group, why give Greece any money at all? Well, I think actually we should be at the end game now. Not just because Greece doesn't deserve any more money, it's because I think the green, Greek economy is in such a bad state and its deficits and debt is so enormous that by doing this you're not actually solving any problems at all. Uh, firstly, on the economy, it's almost tanking at the moment. GDP fell, what, 7% last year? It's going to fall again this year. Unemployment is 22, 23%. I mean, this is, this is unsustainable. And more to the point, it has got no, very little competitiveness. It probably needs a devaluation about 30 or 40 percent to get some go into this economy so she can actually grow. So what is the point of just giving it some money and saying, there, there, stay where you are, keep, keep up the austerity, folks. It's not going to solve any of Greece's problems. So this is just continuing, uh, David, I'll bring you in a second, this is just continuing the madness. Greece it, should just get out of the It's sticking year. plaster time. And, and the indebtedness of Greece is so huge, 160 percent of GDP, it can't possibly pay these debts off. I think it's time for a reality check. Let it default, let it devalue, let it get some and growth and competitiveness back into the economy. Okay, you're already uh, well, biting off your own arm to say something. Yeah, yes, I mean, I, I, I actually think giving them the money at the moment is going, is going to solve nothing. It's not going to be good for the Greek people because they're going to have to, as a deal, take enormous austerity. Secondly, Ruth's absolutely right, it's not going to grow the economy in any way and we're going to be here again. And then the Northern European countries where you, you have democratically elected people who are actually at the moment managing a default in Greece because if banks take a haircut, which they are, what, what is it but a default? And secondly, Greece is being told what to do by another country. So the two things that they say they're not going to have, which is a transfer of sovereignty or ma a managed default, they're having both anyway. And at the end of the day, the Greek people are going to have an awful time for the next 10 years and not solve the issue. So why then do we have the Greek Prime Minister flying into Brussels tonight to say thank you very much? Uh, the German uh, Cause they're Chancellor... Because they're uh, all democratically elected people, aren't they? And, uh, well, the Greek one isn't at the moment, but by and large they elections. And, and, and the problem is, they have got to be seen to do something. But it, the, the thing to be done would actually to be able to get Greece into a position where at some point in the future they can earn enough money as a nation to pay down some debt. I don't see it happening just because they give them money now. That's the sad thing. Uh, these comments are just coming in from uh, Timothy Geithner, who's the uh, American uh, Treasury Secretary. This is a very strong and a very difficult package of reforms, deserving of support of the international community and the IMF. The United States will encourage the IMF to support this agreement. Um, uh, Barbara, of course, the, uh, this has all been felt on the ground economically. You, Among the companies uh, you work with, you're on the board of Air Berlin, which is a German airline, and it's noticed the yeah. impact of this. Yeah, I mean, both from the U.S. perspective as well as looking at a, a country like Germany, you know, it, it's all about, you know, how consumers feel and how much confidence people have in making decisions and going forward. You know, looking at it from, say, the U.S., if Europe falls apart, it's a particularly um, frightening prospect. And when you're sitting in Germany, you may still have a job, you may be having everything fine, but it feels uncertain, and people are pulling back a bit. Neither things are good. So, so to outsiders, to nations yeah. in Asia, to China, the, the countries that, we're going to, that Europe is going to and asking for help to them, this just looks like a disorganized rabble. Well, it makes them wonder what's going to happen next, what happens to Portugal, what happens to Spain, etc. So it, it would be best for Europe as a whole if it could be settled, but, you know, that may or may not be possible. But Ruth says this may not be the settlement. It, it suggests yeah. that there is more to do. I mean, the problem is Greece isn't Argentina, and it worked well for Argentina to be able to take the... 
um, the devaluation, etc. But it's part of a bigger entity. There are similarities and dissimilarities, of course, with Argentina. But in fact, that just brings me on to another point that uh, we've just been talking about Greece, basically. But you touched on some of the other of the eurozone current countries that are weak as well. It's not just Greece that's uncompetitive, but you could argue that Portugal is, and possibly Spain, possibly Italy, possibly Ireland. Although Ireland has had some internal deflation, they've actually got some export industries as well. But the, the, the real problem of the eurozone is that you've got the sort of competitive northern countries, Germany and the Netherlands and Finland, and then you've got this southern st string of countries that really need a 20, 30, 40 percent devaluation in order to be competitive with Germany when you're in a single currency. And That's the fundamental flaw. It's the fundamental problem of the eurozone. And if you, if you were Alex Salmond and, you know, telling the Scottish people, if you have an independent Scotland, we can either have the pound or the euro, well, all I would say is to anybody who's thinking of voting that way, just, just look at this. Well, you've got all these countries in Southern Europe in the position Ruth has just described, having to take it on interest rates, exchange rates, quantitative easing, the whole thing to suit the competitive big country. Germany runs the show. Germany runs the because show. Because it's the biggest economy. So, it, so Scotland's going to sit there and say, well, actually, we'll have the pound. Well, England will run the show. And if he's, no, we'll have the euro, Germany will run the show. And if you, have, if you haven't got inherent competitiveness and an export-based country, then there is a word for it, Greece. Okay. Comment in brackets. Greece. Argentina. <laughs> Yes. What was that comparison? Well, the, the peso, the Argentinian peso was tied with the dollar, wasn't it, mm. back up into the early 2000s, I think it was. Argentina did that because it had hyperinflation in the 1990s. But, of course, the trouble was Argentina was extremely uncompetitive at that exchange rate with the dollar. Well, here's the echo. So Argentina so what tries they did, to harness itself they, to a much more rigorous... So a stronger currency, and they could take it for so long, but they couldn't take it indefinitely. They broke the link with the dollar. I think they had about a, a 30, 40, 50, 60 percent yeah. devaluation on the currency and for a time it certainly had quite a boost to the Argentinian economy yeah. at least they got growth back into the economy but again it was based on um, minerals and yes. exports and agriculture which again isn't Greeks but earning their living Greece around the world tourism, which yeah. is something Greece can't do no. but Greece has got tourism and yeah. that is very price sensitive so should Greece go the Argentinian route well I think they should they should leave the euro and Go and, be, for it. and be done with it and see with it. I think it's time. Make your mind up time. Okay. Thanks very much. Time now for Boom or Bust. It's our quick flick through some of the news stories that you wanted to miss this week. Starting with an itsy bitsy teeny weeny newspaper. This is an edition of a Portuguese weekly paper. No sign of it being yellow or polka dot. Uh, it's less than one inch high and the Guinness Book of Records, which is a much larger publication, certifies it as the world's smallest newspaper. A tall tale? Most definitely not. This is Paul Sturgis, the tall bloke at the back there. His nickname's Tiny, of course. He's in the news this week because he's the first ever British player to sign for the Harlem Globetrotters. He's also, believe it or not, the tallest player they've ever had at 2.37 metres or 7 foot 8 inches. Appropriately enough, the photo call to unveil him was on the top of the Empire State Building. And you might want to put your feet up in retirement, I know I do, but uh, it's not the thing for Dori Noyek. She's only 105 years old and she does voluntary work every day at the local hospital in Florida. Every day. She says her secret is never to complain. Uh, so Barbara, starting with the tiny, tiny newspaper, the lesson from business that we draw from that is even though you've got a product that works, you can never close the door to innovation. Well, and I think given that I worked in a traditional airline industry and then started up a low-cost airline, I think there's something to be said for reinventing the business model within um, a particular industry. I'm not so sure about a teeny-weeny newspaper, but I think it could be said that the, the apps that are now on your iPad, etc., for the newspaper is another example of innovation using new technology to take something that's a, a very traditional product, a traditional business model, and change it and hopefully make more money with there it. There are so many different ways that newspapers are trying to make it work for them, some yeah. of them more successfully than others, but they are realizing that you can charge for something that the public, the reading public up to now, has assumed was free if you add something else onto it. Absolutely. Yeah, and the launch of Go, you alluded to it there uh, in that answer, you were working within BA at the time yeah. as an executive. 
and well, they came to you with the idea, or you went to them with the idea. Let's let's launch another airline within an airline. No, they said um, we need someone to write a business business plan to see if this is a crazy idea or a good idea. And I went at it with a very skepti skeptical approach because I thought I'd been selling you know first class seats in Concord for years and years, and I thought I don't know about this low cost thing. But I got into it, started looking at the numbers, looking at what some competitors had done, and it was actually and continues to be a much better business model than the traditional airlines. So backpackers were not your natural territory? For this no, one. they weren't, but I got in there very quickly and uh, strapped on a backpack myself. Did you feel that uh, it was difficult to sell the idea of what would have been a cuckoo in the nest? Yeah, it was. And in fact, that was the reason British Airways ended up selling Go, was because it was a change of chief executive. And the new chief executive said strategically, I don't want a subsidiary that competes with their own business. But, this is the well, the new guy, Willie Walsh, who's now been there many years, says, oh, that was a big mistake. So we kept it, yes. every time there's a change at the top, you get a strategic shift. Because this is always the problem with big companies, is how you innovate within a larger organization. Innovation is the phrase. And it's tough, and you do have to take risks, and you have to accept that change is required. Okay, Digby Jones, I'm going to ask you about the tall basketball yeah. player, because he's got a skill. Yeah, well, absolutely. And it's his height, and it's yeah. his sporting ability I, as well. I, I mean, I think, I think the business lesson is that the, he, his skill isn't actually that he's seven foot something. Though it um, helps. Uh, well, yeah, but that's not a skill. He, he got that. He's there. The skill is how you actually exploit that what, that you already have and turn it to advantage. So in a business, you've got to mine into the business and find where the talent is and then maximize that talent, lead that talent, get that talent to actually do things it never thought it could. That might be leading people. It might be actually exploiting a market where you're already established but you didn't know certain things are happening. And so I think the lesson we can take from the basketball player isn't that he's seven foot something. It's how do you build round him to turn it to advantage and, and and by the way when you were just looking at the um, old lady doing her stuff the elderly lady uh, my mum retired at Christmas she's 89 this year and she finally packed it in at Christmas so um, and now all, she's getting under everyone's feet oh, well we're really upset about it because she didn't tell us she just went and did it she's 89 <laughs> and she packed it in um, Dory Noyek still going at 105 years old yeah, well, we, my father was 91 we, and he's still playing the organ in church. <laughs> so then. So counting as a part-time job and that so, trumps that one as well. It, it's, a, it's a growing issue, this one, because yeah. there, there, there are two things. One, businesses say they have a shortage of skills mm -hmm. and often it's older workers that have the skills that they need. The other is that we're finding that retirement is becoming more and more expensive and more older people are having to take part-time jobs just to be able to afford it. And their pensions won't be so good as they perhaps were 10 or 15 years ago. So I think it's a sort of a pull-push thing a demand and supply thing, that, that, that the business still wants the skills of people who are adaptable and can change. And I love the way she said, you know, the, the, the mystery of all this, or at least the, the key thing of all this is you don't complain. If, if somebody asks you to do something, you don't particularly want to do it. I mean, it wasn't done like that in my day, was it? No, do it. Just take it by the, you know, grasp it by the hand and say, this is what I've been offered to do, do it. And so you keep, you keep that sort of alertness and aliveness, which is very important, I think, as you go f uh, forward. But on the, on the other hand, so that's the sort of the relationship between mm. the employer and the employee. On the other hand, of course, it is that people are going to have less good pensions than they had 10 or 15 years ago. So that means that people will want or need to work longer than they otherwise did. This point about not complaining. That's never going to work in this country. We like a good wage. Well, we, we do. I mean, it was very interesting. You know, I, I worked for the Japanese company. I worked for an American company, and then I went to work for a British company again. And I noticed that the Japanese didn't complain. The Americans didn't complain either. By goodness me, the Brits complained. And I thought the British company was far better than the American company or the Japanese company. But there you go. But it, it is true. But I think uh, having wit, but a whinge is probably different from a complaining. You know, you might have a whinge and say, well, perhaps this isn't what I should do. But then you just, just, you know, just get on and do it. I think I, humor is the key with a whinge. Humor. So humor can dispel most whinges. So I you think we whinge too much? A little bit, but great humor. I, th I think, I think, think one of the great humor? things... Uh, well, I, I actually think a whinge can be a very constructive thing if, it, if it's channeled properly and it's used properly with a glint in the eye and a smile. Mm. But one of the great things about using older people, and I think the supermarkets find this, is that they're, they are more reliable, they're more dependable, they're, their customer-facing is very good, and they, they actually, if we could do this, 
my, it would give us a fabulous lead, is why don't we put an older person as the mentor to a younger person in a business and bring them on in terms of all the soft skills you need, the confidence, the look me in the eye, turn up to work on time, be a bit more diligent and careful. They're all the talents that older people have developed over the years. To put a younger person under their arm and say, come on, I'll, I'll, I'll take you into that land. That's not about the read, write and count. It's more about the, it's more about the soft skills. But they're so essential. And especially in consumer-facing businesses. Your worry is that there are quite a large number of younger people that don't have oh, those I, essential I, skills. I, I mean, when you think that after 11 years of full-time free compulsory education in Britain, 5 to 16, 11 years of full-time free compulsory education, half the kids who take a GCSE do not get grades here above in English and Maths. So they're coming into the world of work functionally literate and functionally enumerate. And when you have 1.7 million people under 25 unemployed in Britain, I would say to you, and I don't know the exact figure, but I'd have a guess about half of them are unemployable. Because all the businesses of Britain will tell you, biggest challenge to growth, can't get enough skilled people. And you've got rising unemployment? There's something that doesn't add up here. Unemployable. I don't Cannot believe. Cannot be employed. They, well, because we've just heard, haven't we, for, a, for the last few minutes, about how we've moved this country to a value-added, innovative, quality, branded end of the game in goods and services. One thing you need for that, one thing you need if you're going to reform the public sector, is you need skilled people, not rocket scientists, just read, write, count, operate a computer, turn up to work on time, turn up to work at all, and if you actually crack that, then the employer crafts on the rest of the skills. The education system in this nation is delivering people into the world of work who, frankly, are not fit for purpose. So this isn't a failing of employers, in your view, that they're not providing the training that's required because the apprentice scheme is with it. Well, oh, yeah, it's, it's, it's come back now. Yes, it's come back now, but it was allowed to yeah. wither over it's 20 years. System. You're actually saying the problem is done at a much younger level. Definitely. The problem is with the schools. Definitely. You've got, you've got people, 11 and 12, who frankly can't read and write. And then when you start trying to teach them geography when they're 13, it goes straight over their head and you get truancy and drugs and all the rest of the stuff. We have got to address the literacy and numeracy issue in our schools. And if we don't, then in Asia's century, we have got a very difficult time coming. Okay. Lord Jones, thank you very much. Labour has called on the government to cut taxes in next month's budget. Ed Bowles, the Shadow Chancellor, wants a temporary cut in either VAT or income tax. He says it'll give the economy a necessary boost. We need growth. We need action in the budget to get the economy moving. It's the only way to get the deficit down. I think a temporary VAT cut is the fairest way. There are other options the Chancellor could look at to help families, but he needs to act. Doing nothing will make the growth crisis work and make it harder to get the deficit down. You're the economist, is he right? Well, I'd like to know how, just how much he thinks he's going to stimulate the economy by doing this. And what gets me is, of course, that Moody's, one of the credit ratings agency, only last Monday came out and actually downgraded the outlook for our debt, in this, our sovereign debt in this country, from stable to negative. And that means there's a sort of a one in three chance that we might actually have our credit, our credit rating downgraded from the AAA as it is now. Sorry. If that happened, then you get higher interest rates probably through because the bond market would actually react badly to it. And so you might well have some sort of initial kick on the economy by cutting taxes, but then you'd have interest rates going up and it'd be very difficult to see overall exactly what the impact on the economy would these, be. Hang on, these are the ratings agencies that got it so horrifically, ferociously are, wrong I'm sure over the banking crisis. Why should we pay any attention? Well, I'm afraid to say it's not whether you are I listen to the rating, credit rating agencies is whether the markets do. Although, having said all that, of course, when Standard & Poor's did downgrade the United States last August because there'd been this terrific row about, well, about the debt ceiling, if you remember, what happened to Treasury yields in the States? Yeah. They went okay. down. <laughs> so, yeah. in fact, people were still buying them. But even so, I think we're not in such a happy situation in the United States of America. Aren't the markets going to be more worried that we seem to be stuck, that there is growth, but very, very little of it. Well, Unemployment's still rising, and the deficit is getting bigger. Well, I, I take that point, but I would, again, I, I think, put the answer back, or the question back to Ed Walls, and say just how much extra growth does he think he's going to get out of these tax cuts when you're risking put up in, in, putting up interest rates? I think he needs to answer that before we actually entertain this. Barbara, would you cut taxes? Are there any taxes that you think are worth cutting at the minute? I mean, I think taxes are high, but I think fixing the budget deficit is more important. And it's when, when businesses look at whether or not they're going to invest, they're going to create new jobs, etc., they need to be able to predict the business environment. 
So it's, it's a tough situation. Everyone wants lower taxes, but we've kind of come through 10 years of let's do whatever we want and, you know, be gone the consequences. And now we're in dealing with the consequences. So I'm in a tough it out kind of mode. Mm. His argument is if you cut VAT, it gets people spending again. It drives up demand. Yeah, well, I don't think there's much evidence of that. Does it work? And, well, as I say, I think, I think there, there wasn't so much evidence perhaps when the VAT rate was cut a couple of years ago. And you do have this problem of interest rates. By the way, I'm not quite as pessimistic about the economy as perhaps Mr. Balls is. I think by the second half of this year, you could well see it start to pick up again. For a start, the, the squeeze on real incomes that we saw last year when prices inflation was running so far ahead of earnings growth, that will come to an end. And I, I think by the end of the year, there should be some growth back into the economy. I've only got 30 seconds. Yeah. Would you cut taxes? Well, one thing I would do is I'd get the, the employer's tax on jobs, national insurance contribution on employers. I'd abolish it. And I just say, that money, please create. I, I chair a little business in Birmingham, one of my jobs, and we pay £60,000 a year in national insurance contributions, and we are a developing company, so we're not making a profit yet in the business plan, no problem. We would actually employ three more people, and the reason we don't is we're paying national insurance contributions. It's bonkers. Lord Jones, thank you very much. The uh, fashion world, they don't just put on a show for London Fashion Week, they put on a show. Mulberry's catwalk was inspired by monsters. Stella McCartney had a magic trick. It's all about magicking up a few extra sales in Asia. Here's Susanna Streeter. London Fashion Week, when Britain's big names unveil their latest collections and up-and-coming talent get a chance to showcase their skills. This season, the event has a distinctly international flavour, as well as a big push to attract more buyers from Asia and the Middle East. 19 embassies and cultural institutions are promoting the work of 80 young designers from around the world. My inspiration is about nature power and the garment and the human bodies. And then all of the, the, the subject is as a reflection of the radiation and tsunamis and earthquake in Japan. For the London Fashion Week, it was a great opportunity for me. Many of those displaying clothes on the main catwalks here also have their sights set further afield. Maria Gratschvogel has been showing in London for many years. This season, her Art Deco-inspired signature prints and sculptured satin creations are just as likely to be snapped up at her boutiques in Singapore and Taiwan as in her flagship London store. The economy is always going cycles, really, and I would say that the Asian economy is very much where the Western economy was, say, sort of 10, 15 years ago. I mean, Singapore is a completely different place now than it was 10 years ago. It's, um, you know, it's kind of booming, it's really exciting. You've got a very sophisticated and developed customer there that really is, in, I, I guess, they're, they're young, they're cool, but they're also embracing a whole range of designer fashion. And how has it been working as an international designer in this global economic climate? When the whole kind of re the recession thing kind of kicked off in, what, 2007 or thereabouts, I think there was a real shift from the consumer, actually. And people started to think much more carefully about how they shopped, what they bought. Um, and I think as a creator, as a designer, that pushes you much more to really think about design. Um, design in its kind of core essence, because if you think of great design, it should, in a way, be timeless. So um, I think from a creative perspective, it's, I think it's a really healthy thing. From a business perspective, I think it's, it was the natural cycle of where we were going next. In terms of some of the challenges that that's posed, my, my main issue really has been um, suppliers going out of business. I've had a number of, of things like that over the past few years where I've created something and then I wasn't able to actually produce it because I couldn't get the fabric or, you know, then had to source it from somewhere else. So that's been my biggest issue. Quite challenging. Yeah. It, it, and it's sad, actually, when people that have been in business um, for 20, 30, 40 years then just can't make it work anymore. I find that quite sad. Despite such setbacks, her expansion plans in Asia continue. She follows a path blazed by the bigger British fashion houses like Burberry. Its sales rose by 30% in China during the last three months of last year. Asia is also the biggest market for the brand Aquascutum. There is a shift, and, and it's a lot to do with made in England or British designers. Um, and there seems to be um, a, a thought process of, I've got to buy something, wear something, own something that is British. 
key to Maria Gretschvogel's success has not just been her creativity, but also her keen business sense. It was always my dream, actually, since I was about eight, um, to be a designer. And I was cutting and making from age 12. Um, but it was actually someone at London Fashion Week who gave me a lovely piece of advice and said, very talented as a designer, but you need to go learn how to run a business. So I did a little bit of business um, courses and ended up a for a short while in the city. Um, and that gave me sort of good financial background as well, which has been very helpful, I have to say, especially during this time. And as the Autumn Winter Collection 2012 wraps up here at London Fashion Week, she'll be straight back at the drawing board, designing what her customers will want to wear next spring and summer. Next week, a company you use every day, and the chances are you've never heard of it. You'll give an arm and a leg to hear how this one keeps your mobile phone working. Plus, the entrepreneur who tries to save you money because he wasn't earning enough himself as a florist. The Pick of the Bunch, next Sunday night at 9.30, or all week on the BBC iPlayer. <laughs>